Am I coming through okay? You hear me? Okay, well thank you all very much and thank you especially to any of you who were not required to be here, uh, but I enjoy all of your presence nonetheless. Um, if, raise your hand for me if you have already been to a talk by me or an operational option training from pharmacy students. Okay, good. Not very many of you. The ones who are here, um, some of this will sound familiar, but I'm hopeful that I'll have a new spin on it and a little bit of new information. And if, I, if people are, are struggling to answer any questions, please feel free to pop in and share the knowledge that you've gained in the past. So, I'm a pharmacist. I'm also a faculty member, but I work as a pharmacist at a federally qualified health center in town. When I was going to pharmacy school, I learned all about how to reduce people's risk for death by giving them the right medications for blood pressure, for cholesterol, and how to prevent uh, or decrease their risk for death over decades. But I'm not a trauma surgeon. I don't get to pop in and save a life instantly. However, when I did my residency up in Pittsburgh and I had the opportunity to provide people with naloxone, there were five times where I got to have a patient come to me in clinic and say, you saved my life or helped me save the life of another person. For a pharmacist, that's a very unique opportunity. And that's something that inspired me to want to keep doing this work, to bring that to Texas. Uh, and there's never been a time where we need this particular medication more. So I'm going to be a little boring and give you some objectives. A good lecture has objectives. What I'm hoping you'll be able to do after you leave today is discuss trends in prescription and illicit opioid overdoses here in the United States, recognize the role of naloxone in overdose prevention, and describe the overdose prevention model at UT Austin, because we're an institutional leader in preventing overdose deaths among our students. And you may not have heard about it, but we're far ahead of any other university, uh, to my knowledge. And that's due largely to uh, Lori Holler and Steiker, uh, a key person in the School of Social Work who uh, has given me the opportunity to speak with you today, along with Dean Iverson. So i uh, appreciative of that. So let's start by clarifying something. What is an opioid? Can anybody tell me what they're used for? And just shout it out because I can't see you very well. Pain. Pain, okay, that's probably the most common indication. Why else might you use an opioid? I think I heard high, feel good? Okay, absolutely. Anybody know of another use for an opioid? Keep you from pooping, okay, so. Um, if you have diarrhea, then you might take a weak opioid, especially an opioid that just works in your peripheral system, not in your central nervous system, like uh, loperamide or imodium. So uh, opioids have been used for thousands of years. Opioids all come from the opium poppy, or at least they originally did. Anybody seen an opium poppy growing in the United States? They are actually legal. I've seen them growing in California. What is illegal is to score the outside. If you cut the outside of an opium poppy, this white milky substance comes out. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, you've heard of milk of the poppy, this is where that comes from. So opium, uh, which is either taken from this milk or usually it's dried up, it turns into a brown sticky substance that's smoked. Opium has been used for thousands of years and the active ingredient from opium is morphine. Morphine was actually the first drug synthesized from a plant in around 1800, which to me is still mind-blowing that anybody can synthesize a chemical from a plant at, at that stage. But morphine synthesized in 1800, and it quickly becomes a mainstay in pain treatment uh, and surgical anesthesia, especially on battlefields. But what we started to see, or obviously I wasn't around, what, uh, what physicians and other healthcare providers of that time started to see was something they termed soldier's disease. It was essentially a physical dependence on morphine that was developed among people who were treated with it frequently. Now, a company that we now know best for marketing aspirin thought they would capitalize on this opportunity to provide a, a similar drug, a similar derivative to morphine, but that it would work better, and it could even be a replacement for people who were addicted to morphine. So they took these hydroxyl groups, and they made them more lipophilic. 
that makes them cross the blood-brain barrier more readily. Morphine, it mostly gets trapped out in the outer part of your body. It doesn't get into your brain as quickly. So you get pain relief, but you don't get quite as much of the euphoria. They figured out a way to get it into your brain faster, and Bayer Pharmaceuticals brought us heroin. Around 1900, people started to receive samples of heroin in the mail for free. It was used for pain, it was used for addiction, and I probably don't have to get very specific for you to know that that didn't work out all that well. So since about 1900, with the re realization that heroin was an imperfect drug, there's been a, a broader movement toward less potent opioids. If you watch House, you know all about Vicodin. Vicodin was the most prescribed drug in the United States from 2006 to 2013. I started to work in a pharmacy and I saw this enormous 500 count bottle that was never more than an arm's reach away from the pharmacist and it was shocking to find out that that was a generic version of Vicodin. Now that changed in 2013 because of broader realization that people were developing uh, substance use disorders around Vicodin and I'll explain why that's dangerous. You've probably heard that we've got more drug overdoses than car crashes and it's a, a public health nightmare. That's actually been true every year since 2008. But if you look at these lines, deaths due to car crashes are decreasing. Cars are getting safer. Deaths due to drug overdoses are increasing because drugs are getting more dangerous. I'm a person who tries to have a rational viewpoint. I try not to be hysterical about the risks that new drugs might play. But it's pretty clear from trends in the United States that we have a lot to worry about. This is another way of looking at drug overdoses through 2015, drug overdose deaths, showing that more than 50,000 people died of a drug overdose in the U.S. in 2015. That's more than HIV AIDS at the peak of that crisis. So there's no doubt that this is a unique and new issue for us. Reasonable people will argue about the exact root of this problem. But I would argue that this concept of pain, treating pain as the fifth vital sign that was popularized among healthcare providers and healthcare institutions, was a major driving factor, at least of the timing of the increase, and sped it up significantly. So in around 1999, uh, pain societies and hospitals started to integrate this concept. Every time that they would check your blood pressure, your heart rate, your temperature, they would also ask if you had pain. And they would typically ask you to rate that pain on a scale of zero to 10. Now in reality, People experience, they, they somaticize, they experience physical pain related to emotional pain or stress. So we're asking people to rank their, their entire emotional life on a zero to 10 scale. And a lot of people ended up saying they were in pain. For the most part, this occurred in the hospital. And in the hospital, you're only there for a couple days. We're forced to incentivize quick fixes. If you tell us that you got pain in the hospital, you're at a four, we want to make sure we get that to a one before you leave. Physical therapy and losing weight, which are often good sources of pain relief long term, they don't change your pain score in three days. But if you take an opioid or you get an injection of an opioid, your pain score might be relieved within a few minutes. So what we saw as a result of this policy was that opioid prescribing quadrupled in the next 10 years. In a perfect correlation, overdose deaths also quadrupled in those same 10 years. Admission to treatment programs for opioid use disorders went up sixfold. Now if we pull this forward a little bit and we look all the way to 2013, deaths due to prescription opioid overdoses actually seem to plateau uh, and maybe even slow down a little bit starting around 2010. So I talked about amping up prescribing and how that created a problem. What do you guys think might have happened in 2006, 2008, 2010 
that slowed that growth, that caused us to see a, a slowing and increase of prescription opioid overdoses. All right, I'm not gonna repeat the second part because it's too good. So uh, the first part <laughs> is that prescribers were notified that what they were doing was dangerous. They started to see that finally those numbers of increased overdoses, they started getting out into the media, into the scientific literature. It takes on average seven years for a new discovery to be integrated into healthcare. So there's a seven year lag time between when overdoses have dramatically increased and healthcare professionals start to actually do something about it. But yes, by about 2010, there was some awareness, some education for prescribers, and maybe a slight movement away from prescribing opioids. Uh, what else? Economic recession. Economic recession. Um, that's a controversial one. A lot of people would argue that that has driven some a level of opioid use, but the costs of prescription opioids and the clinic visits that it requires to get them might be a, a good indicator, so that's a good answer. Um, what else is currently exists in the healthcare system that prevents prescription drug misuse. Anybody heard of a prescription monitoring program? Those are online databases where prescribers and pharmacists can look up your name and see all of the controlled substances that have been dispensed to you in the last year or two years, depending on where you're at. Additionally, here at UT and especially in the College of Pharmacy, we're very proud of the development of crush-resistant Oxycontin. So crush-resistant pills that made it much harder, though not impossible, to misuse prescription drugs. Um, those things all potentially contributed over time to this plateauing and slight increase, at least temporary, uh, excuse me, temporary decrease in overdose deaths due to prescription opioids. But as our wonderful uh, respondent up here at the front pointed out, that had some unintended consequences. From 2010 to 2013, heroin overdose deaths tripled in the US. And that more than made up for any improvement that we saw in prescription opioid overdose deaths. 2010 is really seen as an inflection point. And the problem that we have is prescription monitoring programs, decreased opioid prescribing, crush resistant Oxycontin, they're introduced into a healthcare system that still discriminates against people with addiction, that does not offer evidence-based treatments for opioid use disorder readily. The medications that are proven to save lives for people who are, have developed a physical dependence on opioids, uh, methadone and buprenorphine are sometimes known as Suboxone, it's really hard to get access to them. Uh, the majority of inpatient addiction treatment programs do not offer either. So we still live in a system where if you're pushed away from prescription opioids, you have really no recourse, you got no safety net except for illicit heroin. The heroin market has also become increasingly dangerous. So I don't know about you guys, heroin seems pretty dangerous to me. I don't want my brother, sister, dad, mom, I don't want anybody I know using heroin if I can help them avoid it. But heroin looks pretty safe when you compare it to some of the other ultra-potent opioids that are in the illicit supply. Now. These are roughly equal potent doses of heroin, fentanyl, and carfentanil. So fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin. Carfentanil, 50 times more potent than that. In Ohio last year, fentanyl was present in the majority of opioid overdose deaths. So fentanyl and carfentanil, they started out as adulterants in the illicit heroin supply. The reason is that you get a more potent, more compact drug, it's a lot easier to transport. When police are cracking down and seizing shipments, you want something that you can pack uh, 100,000 doses of into a, a package that looks like a stereo. Fentanyl and carfentanil fit that bill. There are actually now more than 80 fentanyl analogs that have been identified. So we're seeing an increasing number of these and I could actually get on the regular internet right now, not even the Tor or whatever if you guys are aware of what that is. I get on the regular internet right now and I could order a fentanyl derivative and it would be mailed to my house. 
So this is getting ever more present, and we're working to try to push back against it, but it's a reality. So I showed you, okay, heroin is killing more people. But that's actually shifting too. This light blue line is fentanyl and fentanyl analog related overdose deaths. So in 2013-ish, it's not a major contributor. Today, it's the leading cause of opioid overdose deaths in the United States. That blue line, that's the change in prescription opioid overdose deaths since 2010. They started going up again, but they're not the major driver of this crisis anymore. So when you hear politicians talking about uh, decreasing opioid prescribing to save lives, it's too late. That might help prevent a few people from developing a physical dependence on opioids in the future, and it's not a terrible idea, but it's not going to save the tens or hundreds of thousands of people who have already developed opioid use disorders, and we don't have sufficient policy to help them yet. All right, so I've been really negative so far. Everybody's dying. Everything's bad, and uh, all the stuff that the healthcare system is doing to try to prevent deaths is just causing unintended consequences. So what's a, uh, what are we left with? What else can we do to prevent overdose deaths? What ideas do you guys have? So making a, creating an environment in which it's easier to talk about it, and people can help you to think about ways, methods of prevention. Apologize. I hear a lot about education as a potential option as well. And education's not a bad idea, but people have been using drugs recreationally for thousands of years, as long as we have human recorded history. So it's not necessarily a, a winning policy to say that drug education alone is going to turn the tide on this crisis. So of course the pandering answer here is the one that's in the bottom right corner of your slides. We help people get access to naloxone. This, uh, if you haven't had a pharmacology course, let me give you a, a, a crash course on how opioids work in your body, in your brain. These little blue circles, those are opioids. Think of that as heroin. And these green lightning bolts, those are opioid receptors on your brain stem, on the part of your brain that's like the, the basic lizard brain. And it's the part that manages automatic processes that you don't think about. When opioids attach to those receptors, they do a number of things, I and mean, it kind of depends on where they hit in the body, but they can relieve pain, they can cause euphoric feelings, and at high concentrations, they can slow down your breathing. Your brain just tells you to breathe automatically, you don't have to think about it, but opioids can shut down that process. If you have too high of a concentration, opioids can slow your breathing to the point that you don't have enough oxygen in your blood to keep your heart and your other organs working properly. Eventually, your lungs stop, and your heart stops after. That's how an opioid causes a fatal overdose. If someone has too much opioid on these receptors, you can put naloxone into their body. That naloxone will start working in two to three minutes. It'll find its way to these receptors and it'll get in between the opioid and the receptor. It, when it attaches, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't elicit an opioid-like effect. It doesn't relieve pain. It doesn't cause your breathing to slow, and it doesn't have the opposite effect either. It doesn't cause pain, it doesn't speed up your breathing. It just neutralizes the opioid's effect. So within about two to three minutes of getting someone naloxone, if they were uh, not breathing, they just come back to life. Our UT police chief told, me, uh, told uh, Lori and I a story about a time when he was at the scene of an overdose and he was just considering the guy dead. An emergency medical technician showed up, gave them naloxone, the and they just popped back up and were talking within two minutes. That's the kind of response you can get from naloxone. Naloxone, though, only works for about 30 to 90 minutes. So it wears off, it goes out of your body relatively quickly. Some opioids last a lot longer than that. Methadone, for example, has a half life of 24 hours, so there'll still be some of it in your body four days after you take it. So when someone has an overdose, regardless of whether we have naloxone around or not, they need other emergency medical support. You still have to call 911. 
I describe naloxone to people like a fire extinguisher. Raise your hand if you've got a fire extinguisher. Okay. I'd like to see a few more hands in the future. Um, now keep your hand up if you've had to use it. Okay. Guy in the front, then that's about it. <laughs> so, um, in a room this size, that's going to be a typical response. A couple people have had to use it, and most people just have it around. But you know what? You're glad you had it when you did, right? Okay, good. So, if you have, uh, if you use opioids, if someone you know uses opioids, if you are friends with somebody who's using other drugs and you think they might at some point decide to try an opioid, you should probably have naloxone around. There's really no downside. Recognizing that all 50 U.S. states and the District of Columbia have passed what we call naloxone access laws. Now, they have three main components, and I'll describe what those are for you. Texas, uh, luckily, we are uh, on board now. It took us a while, but we have one of these laws. So the first thing they allow for is a standing order. That allows a prescriber to sign an order so that a pharmacy can dispense naloxone at their own discretion to anyone who might need it or who requests it. 40 Acres Pharmacy on campus has a standing order. You could go in there without ever seeing a medical provider, ask for naloxone, the pharmacist will ask you a couple questions and then they'll sell it to you. There's also third party prescribing, which means that if you go in and ask for naloxone, you don't have to be the person at risk. I could ask for naloxone at the pharmacy because I know my little brother is smoking K2 and I heard that in Arizona there were a couple cases where there was diluted fentanyl on K2. It's actually true. And finally, there's broad liability protection. As a pharmacist, if I give naloxone to somebody, even if I kind of do a bad job of teaching them how to use it, uh, and then they give it to somebody and they do it wrong and so the person that it doesn't live, I don't get in any trouble. The goal of this is to make it so that people who aren't that familiar with naloxone in the healthcare community aren't afraid to give it out. We're increasing access in any way that we can. The Surgeon General actually just re released a report this week that encouraged everyone to get naloxone. So I would encourage you to do the same and build on that recommendation. What some naloxone access laws include and some don't, Texas doesn't, is a concept of medical amnesty. This means that if, um, if me and, I'm gonna pick on the fire hydrant guy, me and the fire hydrant guy uh, are using heroin together, and I decide that I'm gonna add a little bit of Xanax, a medicine that might add to the respiratory depression and, and central nervous system sedation. I decide I'm gonna add a little bit of that for the first time. I end up stopping breathing. He can't wake me up. He tries to take his knuckles and rub them on my chest like we teach you to do in operational oxone trains, but I'm not saying anything. My pupils are tiny. He decides to call 911 because he wants to save me. He's a nice guy. When the police show up, he can still totally get arrested, even though he was trying to save my life because of his drug use, and I can still get in trouble for my drug use even though I was going to die if we didn't call 911. Some states have passed medical amnesty, which protects you from any criminal prosecution. Um, even in states that have that, it's not absolute protection. It depends on the amount of drug that's in the house. If there are other drugs, you may be prosecuted for that. So it's an imperfect remedy, but, but some states have tried to do that to encourage people to call 911. Naloxone comes in several versions and they differ a lot in price. So the tried and true, the one that saved more lives than any other, is the old naloxone vial. You need an intramuscular syringe, you gotta pop the cap off and draw up the liquid and inject it in somebody's muscle. I don't know about you guys, if I overdose and this is what I got on hand, I'm worried about my mom's ability to draw up a milliliter of fluid and inject it into my arm. People think that if they get a little bit of air in the syringe, I might die. So if they're not experienced, they might squirt the liquid back out without ever administering it. There are, there are downsides. It's a great formulation if we're taking care of people who inject drugs and everyone around them injects drugs or knows how, uh, but it's not perfect. However, 
it's only $17 for two of them, which is what we consider a kit. You need to have two doses in case the first one's insufficient. Uh, and I ran it through my UT insurance and it was $10 for two of them. So it's pretty cheap. It's very easy to access. Again, you can go get this at the 40 Acres Pharmacy. Now, because a lot of people don't feel comfortable drawing up fluid and injecting it, this version of naloxone that comes in a pre-filled syringe was adapted for intranasal use. You take a, a pre-filled syringe, you click a few pieces together after popping off the yellow and purple caps, and then you screw a little nasal adapter on the end. With that, I can just squirt it in their nostril, and they come back to life. So that one has some definite advantages. The downside is there's a lot of fluid in there. It wasn't really made to be given in your nose. So we recommend that you split it up half of the dose in each nostril so that all the fluid doesn't drain out of your nasal cavity. Also, people can break the glass when they're putting the pieces together, and studies have shown that when people try to use this for the first time, about 50% of the time they make some sort of mistake that would result in at least suboptimal dosing. But it's $40 for two of those and still only $10 through my insurance. Now we're about to jump up in price and before I show you these, I want to let you know that these two drug companies have provided me with free medication to distribute. So I might be a little biased, and I want you to know that in advance. I don't think I am. I try to be critical, but, but just so you know. Narcan nasal spray is $150 for a box of two. But you don't have to do anything. It comes in a box that has instructions built right into the front cover regarding how to use it, how to respond in an overdose situation, you pop open the box and you've got two sealed doses of Narcan. When you open up this little foil pack, you basically have something similar to Flonase. You don't have to be trained to do anything. You just stick it in one nostril, push down on the button. There's a small poop of a tiny volume of fluid that's easily absorbed in one nostril, and you're done. It's also one of the highest dose versions of naloxone. So if we do have to worry that people might need slightly higher doses with ultra-potent opioids, this should cover it. That said, that's not substantiated. So uh, to our knowledge, low doses of naloxone will still reverse ultra-potent opioid overdoses. But um, this might be extra safety in the future. What's the downside to giving someone a huge whopping dose of naloxone? What's the worst thing that could happen? Yes? Nothing. Nothing, okay. I like that answer. I will say for some patients, they might experience something that's not life-threatening, but not very comfortable. Withdrawal. Withdrawal. So if I use opioids rarely, this was a, a one-night thing with me and my buddy um, using the heroin, then when I get naloxone and all that opioid goes off the receptor really quickly, I'll just come back to life. I'll just start breathing again, and I'll feel fine. If I use opioids every day because either I've developed a physical dependence to illicit use or because I use prescription opioids every day for my chronic pain, and I get naloxone, and all of a sudden those receptors that are really used to having opioids on them don't, I could go into pretty significant acute withdrawal. Opioid withdrawal is almost never fatal, and it's not acutely fatal. It's not going to kill me right now. With the appropriate medical support, it won't kill you. So giving someone naloxone when they're not breathing is always the right answer, but worst case scenario could cause withdrawal. Higher doses might be more likely to cause significant withdrawal symptoms. All right, and the last one that I'm going to point out is also the most expensive. I'm going to let you see what it does before I ask you to guess how much it costs. It's called the Evzio Auto Injector, and if you are allergic to peanuts or something and you have an EpiPen, something called the AviQ, then you may have seen this technology before. It's the same sort of uh, technology. So I take this cartridge. Again, the box is going to have two of them in there. I pop it open. This trainer contains no needle or drug. If you are ready. 
ready to use. Pull off red safety guard to inject. Place black end against outer thigh. Then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. All right, now my mom could probably do that. Um, so it has some advantages. How much do you think a box of two of those things costs? Remember I said uh, 14 40 150 $500. $500, all right, higher. Is that, oh, come on, guys. So current retail price listed for a box of two Ezio auto injectors is $4,200. Now, it's a silly gimmick. Nobody pays that. I don't know why that's the listed cash price, but I will say, as opposed to all of these other options which are covered on in my insurance, that one requires what we call a prior authorization, which means that if you want to prescribe it, you have to call up the insurance company and explain why it's the only one. And they probably have some very specific criteria for how you would qualify. Um, can you guys think of anyone in Texas for whom this wouldn't be the best option? They don't speak English, or more importantly, um, you can't make any assumptions based on what your patient speaks or what your friend uh, or the person who's getting naloxone speaks because you don't give naloxone to yourself. So it's always possible that the person who finds you might not speak English. Uh, more than half of my patients at the community care health center don't speak English. So I don't know about you guys, if I pop open a, a dose of uh, life-saving medication when my friend is dead on the floor and it starts yelling at me in German, I'm going to struggle. That's not helping the situation. So, um, so this is an imperfect option in my opinion. So I'll be fully transparent. Um, we have a, a state-funded uh, distribution program to prevent overdoses throughout Texas, and we mostly buy Narcan nasal spray, but because of cost, we also buy a whole lot of the intramuscular vials and syringes, and we distribute those throughout the state, especially to agencies that work with people who inject drugs. Now, why is any of this pertinent to the university? Well. The Texas Overdose Naloxone Initiative and the Students for Sensible Drug Policy, SSDP, an organization here on campus that, by the way, has won a National Chapter of the Year for some of their great work and advocacy, they were trying to educate people around campus about overdose prevention. And through those trainings, they heard about a handful of UT students who had died in the last year due to drug overdoses. That's not information that we have at the university. That's protected health information. And it's often not something that families talk about. When their kid overdoses on drugs, they usually try to keep it quiet, unfortunately. So they heard these stories, and they made a big push to have a naloxone standing order in the campus pharmacy, and also were trying to get people to listen to the idea of having naloxone in the dorms. In response to a student government uh, resolution that they pushed through regarding the standing order in the campus pharmacy, a wellness network committee was convened. We had tons of representation on that committee. Uh, we had academic units. Uh, we had health services units and uh, the campus police and residence life representing the dorms. And through this process, we were able to become one of the first universities in the country to stock naloxone, and to my knowledge, the very first one to actually put it in public places so that a student could get it without going to the health center. Um, so it was actually there when you might need it. The mechanism that we went through to, to make this happen is we now train all of the resident advisors during their orientation each year. And we have these naloxone boxes in the 24-hour desks, all of the 24-hour desks in the dorms. So every one of them has a box like this mounted on the wall with two doses of Narcan nasal spray. If you need it, if you think someone might have overdosed in your, your residence hall, if you got a friend who isn't responding, you run down to the 24-hour desk, you ask them for the naloxone. Anyone is authorized legally to administer naloxone. 
We trained all 100 plus UTPD officers to respond to overdoses with naloxone, and we equipped them with the fancy talking one. Again, we didn't pay for any of it. The drug company gave us uh, 100 plus of those for free. And this is useful. This is important. These places should have naloxone. But what we're quickly learning is that most of those doses are going to go unused, just like the fire extinguisher that's under your kitchen sink. Where we really need to get naloxone is into the hands of people who use drugs and people who are friends of people who use drugs. In our attempt to accomplish that, what we've done is train more than 400 pharmacy students to go out and do miniature trainings around campus. In the first year of Operation Naloxone, we did 10 trainings, all in university co-ops. We gave away doses of naloxone to every co-op. This past year, there were some trainings in dorms. We did a training at the College of Liberal Arts. We've done trainings in a couple of classrooms. And if you want to get training from us, go to operationnaloxone.org and your organization can request it. Um, additionally, just like a brag about how we're leading again, um, there are several other pharmacy schools in Texas that are now trying to copy this approach and we're working with them to give them materials and support that. We've also got 20 medical students from Del Med and 20 social work students who've been trained to provide operational oxone uh, education. So you can go to operationaloxone.org. You can learn more about opioids. You can learn more about fentanyl and other ultra-potent opioids. Uh, if you know anyone who's a healthcare professional, they can get free CE on the website. And we have a webinar there for academic administrators because we're trying to get more colleges to stock naloxone in the same fashion. A lot of colleges are talking about it. Uh, Dr. Holler and Steiker and I, we did a webinar and we surveyed the administrators who came on. And these were gonna, you know, they came to our webinar, so they were open-minded about this. And about half of them said that they have naloxone somewhere on campus. All of them said that that naloxone was locked away in the university health center somewhere. So if you overdose during your medical visit, you're going to be safe. Um, but outside of that situation, it's wasted. All right, so before I open it up for you guys to ask me questions, I want to ask you a couple. Um, can I administer naloxone to somebody if it is expired? <coughs> I'm a pharmacist, right? I'm supposed to be really anal about this stuff. It's like, it's bad the day after. Um, there's only one medication that degrades into a harmful product. <laughs> Tetracycline, over time, can degrade into something that can cause problems in your body. Everything else just gets less potent. So, if it's all you got around, you can absolutely administer expired naloxone. If it is a low-dose version, like the vial, it really might be less effective. I worry a little bit. If it is a high dose version, like the nasal spray, it's probably going to take 10, 15 years for this to degrade to the dosing level of that vial. So I'm not too worried about it being expired. Uh, we've got to make sure what we have on campus is expired for legal reasons, but uh, realistically, uh, whenever those expire, I give them to the Austin Harm Reduction Coalition, and they give them out to people who need them because we know they still work. Okay, we talked about this one. What happens if I administer too much naloxone? Most of the time, nothing. Worst case scenario, if you have someone with a physical dependence on opioids, they could experience uh, withdrawal. It's really uncomfortable. It's not going to kill them. Where can you get naloxone? Forty Acres Pharmacy. You can also get it, or should be able to get it, at CVS, Walgreens, uh, HEB. They all have standing orders, but to be honest, it's variable. When I went to pharmacy school, I got no real education about naloxone. Lay administration, home administration of naloxone was not something that we talked about. So it's very likely you walk into one of those stores and the pharmacist doesn't have it in stock, or they might not even feel comfortable doing it. If you walk into a store like that, point them to operationaloxone.org. That's what our whole education is for, is to make sure that we change that situation. Now here's a more philosophical question. And if somebody would be willing to give me a, a stand up and give a little bit of a longer answer if you have an opinion, I'd really appreciate it. 
Will naloxone enable drug users to chase higher highs? This is a, an argument I hear a lot, and I want to know what you guys think about it. Does giving somebody naloxone, could it be a problem? So it's a, I think that's a reasonable thought process, that if you give people a safety net, then they might take the opportunity to jump, because it's fun falling. And there are anecdotal reports of people pushing to a higher dose of, of heroin than they ever had before with naloxone. There are anecdotal reports of people mixing with a new drug uh, and having naloxone. But there are a lot of reasons why I don't think that that's probably true or the case most of the time. One of the reasons is that if you have a physical dependence on opioids, you spend most of your time trying not to go into withdrawal. You're probably not using opioids really to get high anymore. You're using them to not be sick. And withdrawal makes you feel really sick. Additionally, when you wake up from an overdose, there, there was a story from a, a former heroin user who's now in the harm reduction community written for the Washington Post recently. You wake up on the sidewalk in a place you can't remember being, surrounded by paramedics with a cop nearby, and strangers that have been hitting you because they don't know the proper way to wake somebody up from an overdose. That's not how you want to wake up. So there are a lot of reasons why I think that chronic opioid users would not use it as that sort of safety net. But there could be times where that's true. And there also might, might it, over time, if we make it so, so safe to use illicit opioids because we have tons of naloxone around, you could argue that it might change the environment to where people see opioids as less dangerous. I think given the graphs I showed you earlier, we're a long way from that, but, but you make a good argument for it. Now, the best argument against it is that there have been a bunch of cities and regions where naloxone access has been dramatically increased, where harm reduction groups have given it out for free. And what we've seen in every community where naloxone access has increased is that overdose rates go down and admission to opioid treatment programs increase. People in the harm reduction community will frequently say, the only thing naloxone enables is breathing. Or another way you could say, that naloxone enables recovery. Someone who would have died is now alive another day to possibly seek help. All right, so a couple of key points, and I'll leave these up while I'm answering your questions, but um, opioid overdose deaths are increasing. It was a prescription-driven problem. Now it's an illicit-driven problem. Naloxone is the antidote to an overdose. And if you give it to someone who hasn't overdosed on opioids, it's totally harmless. You can buy naloxone at the campus pharmacy. If you live in a dorm and it's an emergency situation, you can access it at a 24-hour desk. If, uh, I don't have very many doses, but um, if you don't have the means to go to the 40 Acres Pharmacy and buy it yourself, uh, come up to me afterwards, I may be able to give a few of you doses of naloxone if you're really worried about, about yourself or anyone who you know or you just want to be prepared. Um, but it's a limited number, so uh, please be, help me be judicious. Uh, okay, so what questions do you all have? And it can be about naloxone and overdose specifically or other stuff on opioids. Yes? Let me confirm, I, so why do I think the rise of benzodiazepine use and misuse uh, hasn't been addressed in, in the same way. If you are, if you have a chronic physical dependence on uh, Xanax, and I give you flumazenil, which is the, the antidote to a benzo overdose, you will have seizures and die. Probably. Um, so it's not as safe to withdraw from benzos, so we can't address it in the same way. Uh, if someone has a benzo overdose, they might get a little bit of flumazenil in the hospital, but it's really important that we carefully monitor and titrate the dose. Um, what you bring up is really important, though. Opioid use, uh, excuse me, benzo use, is dramatically increasing, and it's one of the most common drugs to be mixed with opioids that causes an overdose. Um, you have to take massive amounts of a benzo like Xanax in order to overdose on the benzo alone. You almost couldn't. Um, but if you
you add just a little bit of alcohol or a little bit of opioid, all of a sudden it's really easy. So benzos are definitely an area where we need to focus more on education, being cautious about prescribing, um, but they, we can't treat it in quite the same way as far as overdose reversal. Training for naloxone uh, and overdose response is improving. There's a lot of federal funding that's going out to various agencies like us. Um, there, if you don't have someone in your area that you know to reach out to in other places, anyone can go to getnaloxonenow.org. There's an interactive online training that gives a certificate at the end. You don't need any sort of certificate, uh, but it's a, a nice uh, confirmation that you've learned what you need to about overdose response. So getnaloxonenow.org is a good option, uh, but every state has been given federal funding to increase naloxone access and awareness. So if you go to state health agencies' websites and look for naloxone, um, you should be able to find information. Yes? Okay, so I didn't want to overlap too much with the operational naloxone training, but um, if someone has overdosed, or you think they might have overdosed, um, what kinds of things might you do to try to wake somebody up? Think about if you're desperate, your family member or friend is on the floor not responding, what are you going to do? How are you going to try to wake them up? Slap them. Slap them. All right, what else? Shake them. Yell their name. Hit them in the face. Throw them in the shower. Pour cold water on them. Put ice in their pants. Uh, these are all things that people will actually do. I would discourage you from doing anything that could cause long-term damage. Hitting someone in the face can cause real damage. You can take your fist, everyone make a fist like this. Take your knuckles and put them in the center of your chest. Push real hard and rub down. It feels slightly uncomfortable. If it wasn't your, you doing it to yourself, trust me, you could push harder and it would be really uncomfortable. But it doesn't cause any permanent damage. It's called a sternal rub. That's what we usually recommend. If someone doesn't wake up to the sternal rub, they might be in cardiac arrest, they might have uh, experienced an opioid overdose, there are a lot of possibilities. You want to call 911, and if you have no option around, you can give it to them. Yes, sir. Is it possible to be addicted to naloxone? Um, so, what I didn't explain in here is the, some of the terminology behind the pharmacology. Opioids are considered agonists of the opioid receptor. They activate it. That's how they cause pain relief and euphoria. Naloxone is what we call an antagonist. It just blocks the receptor. It doesn't activate it in any way. If you take naloxone, you don't feel anything. And you can't become dependent, physically dependent on naloxone. So no, you can't misuse naloxone, and you can't develop a physical dependence on it. <coughs> yes? What's my opinion on decriminalization? Um, that's a hard one to answer as a healthcare professional um, because there's a lot of, I think, baseline viewpoint that people don't necessarily have the knowledge they need to make informed decisions about medication use in general. That means maybe your blood pressure medicine. I don't, I don't think that people should have access to uh, lisinopril, a blood pressure medicine, without a medical visit because it could be harmful to your kidneys. Um, so I, I do worry a little bit about broad legalization of illicit substances or decriminalization. I don't, I don't really know that decriminalization is that different, ultimately. Um, now, there are countries like Portugal that have decriminalized with great success. And we don't have to jump straight to de decriminalizing everything. Uh, I think you can make a pretty good argument for decriminalizing illicit opioids in our current system. Um, and maybe if the tide turns on overdoses a little bit, that could be reconsidered. I don't know that I am certain about what the right policy is, but I do think that it's enough of an emergency that decriminalization might, um, might empty out some of our, our people in prison who shouldn't be there, might make it a little bit less stigmatized to try to access recovery treatment. Um, so I would say that I'm generally in favor of decriminalization, but I try to be a little bit balanced in the consideration of it. Is it true that states that have legalized marijuana have lower 
is it true that states that have legalized marijuana have lower overdose rates? Um, the short answer is yes. States that medicalized cannabis, that made it something that could be prescribed, saw at least a decrease in the growth of overdose rates. Opioid overdose rates are going up everywhere, but they're not going up as fast in places that have medical cannabis. More recent analyses of recreational cannabis laws have shown states that have recreational cannabis also have that same trend, that lower proportion of opioid overdose deaths. So it, there's definitely very encouraging preliminary evidence that, that legalizing cannabis could help to address the opioid crisis. Um, and frankly, is, has much, many fewer adverse consequences than decriminalization of illicit opioids or other ultra-potent substances. So uh, that's something that we could do today, but that's not something that I think the, the current Department of Justice is probably very likely.